This is G Free Radio. Here's your host, Peter Stewart. Hello, I'm Peter Stewart. Welcome to G Free Radio. Our first guest this week, Shirley Plant, the author of Finally, Food I Can Eat, who's had to develop her life and lifestyle to incorporate multiple food allergies. Hear how she copes with different ingredients, different reactions between them, and juggling rotation diets, all while being a busy businesswoman. And we start a new series looking at the different G-free foods available from different communities and cultures around the world. This week, hear from Afia from Afia. A samosa shop. Plus, a new report which suggests that chronic intestinal damage raises the hip fracture rate in celiac disease patients. The effect of gluten on a woman's period comes under the spotlight. We take a note of some of the gluten freers among downhill skiers, well, and other sports, but they didn't rhyme as well, at the Winter Olympics. And as our series on alternative G-free grains and flowers draws to a close, we suggest five different kinds of rice that are nice. I'm at it again. Tracking on then, and this report saying that celiac disease patients who experience chronic damage in the small intestine may be more likely to break a hip than those whose intestinal tissues have begun healing, according to new research in the Endocrine Society's Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. It says patients face a higher risk of breaking a bone if they've got celiac disease, but studies have reached contradictory conclusions about whether the fracture risk remains elevated long after the disease is diagnosed and managed with a gluten-free diet. We believe that giving the mucous membrane, the moist tissue lining the small intestine, a chance to heal can lower the risk of complications, including bone fractures in celiac patients, as according to one of the study's authors. And they go on to say that sticking to a gluten-free diet is crucial for minimising tissue damage and reducing the risk of a serious fracture that could cause other complications. The study found that people who had persistent tissue damage were more likely to break a hip. And they conclude, physicians have debated whether people with celiac disease actually benefit from a follow-up biopsy to determine the level of tissue healing that's actually taking place. These findings suggest that a follow-up biopsy can be useful for predicting complications down the road. That report from ScienceDaily.com, you're hearing about it on G-Free Radio, and we're talking about women and periods when they have a complication with reaction to gluten a little bit later on in the programme. Moving on, and our guest this week, our first guest, as usual, we have two of them, is Shirley Plant. She was diagnosed with multiple allergies, and that, well, really was the making of her because she had to, she discovered develop different ways of cooking that's quite unusual, different foods and also rotation diets as well, a phrase that I must admit I wasn't familiar with, and if you're not yet, you will be in a couple of three minutes. In the first of our two-part interview, we talk about how to save time in the kitchen so you're not making different meals for those people with different allergies in your family. Shirley Plant, on the line from Ottawa, Canada. Gee, I was sick sort of starting when I was 18, 19, and nobody knew what was wrong with me. And of course, the doctor said, oh, it's all in your head. And there's, you know, the blood test came back fine. All the tests came back fine. But I just always felt sick, always had stomach upset and, you know, you name it, headaches. And so finally, I did some allergy testing and it came back that I had all these multiple food allergies. I could, I was allergic to to dairy and wheat and yeast and corn and apples and tomatoes and you know the list sort of just went on and so I started to avoid some foods and I felt a little bit better so that that was great but I really didn't get totally better so they kept searching and I kept searching but I just kept living my life and sort of struggling all the time And then I found out I had chronic fatigue syndrome, which, of course, back then, that was 27 years ago. It really wasn't 
known what it was and again they just said to me you know there's not much you can do you have to live with it and I have since learned that you know there are lots that you can do and uh, helping your diet and um, paying attention to your thoughts and you know I've looked into energy medicine there's really a lot that people can do to help themselves for sure and I'm a type A personality, so I just kept going and going and going until my body said no more. And then I had to stop. So at the ripe age of 28, uh, sort of right in the midst of my career, that ended and I ended up on disability. So I really was very, very sick for years. And then I kind of hit a bit of a plateau. And that's when... I got into the kitchen and I started making recipes because I was sick and tired of eating rice cakes and rice crackers and, you know, really boring things. And I took sort of my favorite recipes that, you know, my mom used to make me, sort of the comfort foods, and I made them, quote, allergy free. I'll be very honest, I threw away thousands and thousands of dollars worth of food <laughs> and I made my family try horrible things and they were very good. But then I kind of figured it out what flowers worked, what were the alternatives and the substitutes, and I started coming up with really good recipes. And then I have um, a wonderful environmental doctor that I see here in, in Ottawa, Canada, and, and she said, you know, my patients would love a cookbook like this, you know. But she said, when you have multiple food allergies, there's there's really not anything out there, and I guess I wanted my cookbook to be more than a cookbook. I wanted it to be a dietary guide. I wanted to be able to people to buy it and learn lots from it. So I talked about rotation diets because if you have allergies, you know, you don't want to just start eating one food because you may develop an allergy to that food. Uh, I wanted to talk about the food chemicals, the natural food chemicals that were in our food that, that some people were reacting to. I wanted to talk about... What's the difference between an allergy and an intolerance? You know, some people really didn't know the difference between that. I wanted to have a chapter for people how to substitute. So if someone in the family can have eggs, but someone else can't have eggs, how can you take a muffin recipe and really make the same muffin recipe for both those people so that mom or whoever isn't making two or three different meals? I mean... And, and that, that, that turns out to be expensive, doesn't it? And time consuming. And heck, think of the washing up. <laughs> exactly. So and you know what? And sometimes it's really hard for people too. like I used to stare gazingly at his food thinking, <laughs> oh, can I just have some of that? It helps with a bit more of the understanding, doesn't it? If, for, for, from one of the, I don't know, muggles, I suppose, if they understand what we're going through on a day to day basis. Right, exactly. And then, you know, about six years ago, I found out that I was celiac. So that kind of put the icing on the cake, shall we say. And I went, ah, because I was still every now having spelt and camut and a little, you know, sort of cheating here and there because, I mean, I was supposed to avoid wheat, but I didn't really think I had to avoid gluten. And, I, so I, 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 and those were viable alternatives, weren't they, presumably yeah. for you? Yeah. Yeah, and barley and rye I was making rye bread, and so I thought, okay, <laughs> let's let's add this one to the pile. <laughs> you're a you're a walking medical miracle. I mean, I'm not, but I, I, I don't mean to you know demean your situation, but there can't be many people like you, Shirley, who have an allergy to so many different things. That must be very very difficult indeed. But it sounds as though you're getting through to, to through it all. For sure. And you know what? There actually are people like me. And that's kind of, you know, the scary part and the sad part, because I think, what have we done to our food? What have we done to our environment that, you know, I see kids in my dietary practice now that they do. They have multiple food allergies. And, you know, like me also, I think when your immune system is so suppressed, you know, I developed these environmental allergies and, you know, reacted to almost everything, you know, including the air I was breathing. And, and so, you know, what is going on? What are we doing to our, as I said, to our food that, that is creating these, these issues? You think it's, it, 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 it's the air, it's the food, it's the soil, it's our upbringing, it's what genetics as well, it's a combination of all of those things? 
I think so. I, I really do. I think it's unfortunately the pesticides and all that that we've just felt that we've had to uh, use to have more food to feed the world. But you're right, you know, that this whole high fr fructose corn syrup is in everything. You must have come up with some fantastic recipes, but I, I'm, I'm racking my brains to think what they might include. <laughs> Well, it's funny. That's what people said to me. You know, what what is in there? You know, sticks and stones and yeah, a little dirt and sure. But you know, exactly. There there are so many alternatives now. I go into quote our health food store now, and there is so much compared to years ago. And and we can look at some of the ancient grains and seeds. We've got quinoa, which is a wonderful. Really, it's a seed, not a grain, and it, it has all the properties of a pro protein. So it's great for vegetarians. It's great for uh, non-vegetarians. You can, you know, grind it down and buy it as a flour and make quinoa pancakes. I have a quinoa pancake recipe. You can put, you can make it into a salad, quinoa salad. It can be a breakfast cereal. You can put it in your soups and stews to thicken if you want. You know, there's things like millet and amaranth and of course if we're baking we've got brown rice flour we've got sorghum or chickpea flour uh, almond flour is a great substitute if you're baking and you can do nuts you know some of the starches the t tapioca the arrowroot I mean they're all substitutes that really work well flax seed chia seed work very well in, in place of an egg now certainly if a recipe calls for three or four eggs you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to have to just say, well, got to give that one up. But if it's a recipe that just needs one egg, you can certainly substitute with flax or chia. And they ha have so many healthy properties as well. I mean, if you have to avoid milk, there are, you know, many different. There's rice milk, there's almond milk, soy milk, there's flax milk, hemp milk coconut milk. I mean, really, we do have lots of alternatives. And, you know, I know a lot of celiacs, and I don't know, uh, over there in the UK, you know, maybe follow more of a paleo diet where they eat healthy meats and just lots of vegetables. And, I mean, really, there's so much out there to eat. We don't need a diet that's, uh, you know, full of toast and sandwiches. If we lived in Japan or Maybe uh, South America, you wouldn't be having a toast for breakfast and sandwiches. You'd be having rice or fish or, you know, an avocado. And so lots of options in, in my cookbook for sure. Shirley Plant from Ottawa, Canada, and you can follow her at deliciousalternatives.com and also on Facebook, Finally Food I Can Eat, and that is also the name of her book, Finally Food I Can Eat, and we'll catch up with a little bit more from Shirley in next week's episode of the G-Free Radio Show. talking about gluten-free samosas in a few moments' time. First of all, the effect of gluten on a woman's period, another health item in this week's programme. And uh, if you're a woman, as of course nearly two-thirds of people with celiac disease are, and also a majority of those with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, you're probably familiar with some of the effects gluten can have on your menstrual cycle. Now, in case you're wondering why two-thirds of people with celiac disease are women, I suspect it's probably down to the fact that women identify themselves or problems with themselves, uh, sensitivities or aches and pains. They're more likely to go to a GP as well rather than anything actually inbuilt into the genetic makeup of women. I think that's generally understood. But back to the point of this article from celiacdisease.about.com, Gluten can make your period absolutely miserable. Menstrual cramps so horrible you feel nauseated. Headaches that can find you to bed, very heavy bleeding as well. How much these symptoms improve once you go gluten-free is not terribly well documented, apart from just general thoughts and a few blogs here and there. But I've yet to see any proper research into that, which is interesting. But this report saying it's amazing the effects that gluten can have on your entire body. Well, that much we know, but 
being a chap, it's never really concerned me, or I've never really considered it, perhaps a bit more accurately, about how it may affect women specifically in this particular area. And, and, and indeed, therefore, how much better you may feel once you're following a gluten-free diet. Now, I say I hadn't come across it before, but... There is one major study that's found a direct link between celiac disease, pelvic pain and endometriosis. In fact, in many cases, menstrual problems were the women's first sign that something was amiss. Going back to what I said at the start of this article about women more likely to be aware of changes in their body and more likely, therefore, to be going to health to see a health professional. And that same study found that about half of women with celiac disease reported severe menstrual cramps. Unfortunately, no comparable research on women with gluten sensitivity. So as I say, there is still quite a gap in the research which maybe needs to be filled. Uh, Those two reports, you can find them at celiacdisease.about.com, American spelling of celiac disease. This is Peter Stewart. It's G Free Radio. G-freers who are downhill skiers, <laughs> coming up a little bit later on, in other words, some of the athletes who are taking part in the Winter Olympics who are on a gluten-free diet. And also we're going to be bringing you another episode of our series looking at alternative grains and flours. Now last week we looked at some of the rice family and we'll consider that a little bit more in this week's episode and also look again at rice in next week's episode as well. All the different varieties and the things that you can do with them certainly inspired me to search out some different kinds of rice that I can cook with and some of the different dishes that I can make as well. But we now start a new series looking at different G-free foods whose Heritage is from different cultures around the world. Asia and Italy on our list for forthcoming weeks. But this week we talk about samosas, popular, of course, in the Indian subcontinent and also the Mediterranean and Africa as well. They're fried or baked pastry with a savoury filling. Hi, I'm Afia and my mom is mom, Ruxana, and the company is called the uh, Afia Samosa Shop. Okay, so tell me, this I mean, obviously samosas, it's in the name, isn't it? But you've got some fantastic things here, and I've not seen the like before. Tell me your range. We have a huge range, actually. We do gourmet wheat pastry samosas, 13 different varieties. And of those, 11 varieties we make in wheat and gluten-free as well. So it's luxury filling, luxury pastry in the wheat and gluten-free range, because my mom has celiac disease. And that's what inspired me, to stop her from nibbling on other people food she can have her own now she can have her own she's on a diet (laughs) and over the years i I would imagine that the ethnic food has been hard to come by in in a gluten-free range definitely it has been uh the main reason is there's a lot of contamination issue i've researched into this in my past academic life and the hospitality industry food and drink industry at that time like 10 years ago wasn't very aware about this and in the ethnic range People didn't care. But a lot of people in the ethnic communities do have celiac disease or food intolerance. So they were coping with it within their family environment. They understood. But when they went to their wedding or a function and you said, I, I can't have this, they said, oh, okay, just have the other thing then. That's still got that ingredient in which they cannot eat. They just won't understand. And that's the thing. It's a, it's a cultural issue. So a lot of education needs to be brought into this. It's becoming aware now because a lot of people are coming out and saying, look, we have this intolerance, we have this allergy, we have this uh, celiac disease, and uh, we're not going to have this and that. You have to accept it, and we want someone to cater for us. I think I was one of the first ones to come out with this. I was going to say, I've not seen these before, so uh, congratulations. Tell me your range, because I'm looking here. We've got, uh, what, uh, um, seven or eight different uh, different items here. Yes, Talk have. me through. Tempt my taste buds. Well, today we just catered for the uh, vegan and vegetarian people. I didn't bring any meat, but meat to samosas are available on order, frozen, anywhere nationwide, by courier delivery, overnight courier delivery, through our online shop, or contacting me directly. I can even do custom made. But today what we have, is uh, of the vegetarian range samosas, traditional vegetable, potato and peas, 
of course. Then you've got uh, red uh, fresh chilies, traditional vegetable, uh, for those who like some green chilies in their food. Spiced mixed vegetable, which has mixed vegetable potatoes with uh, ginger and garlic. And then uh, you've got the paneer for the cheese lovers, Indian cheese. No potatoes. You can't have potatoes in everything. <laughs> with mixed vegetables, so there's a lot of uh, cheese in there. And it also sort of has ginger and garlic in there, so it's a, uh, less than medium hot. And then those who love their food super, super, super hot, if they're feeling a, in a slow suicide, that that's what they're looking for. The Scotch bun is chilli. Of course, there's got potato and peas in there. It also has jalapeno to help the effects. Um, we do do the limited edition in the summer and for Halloween called the Inferno. As the name suggests, it is a vegan smosa, but it's got five different chilies in there. And one of them is, uh, two of them is the um, naga and the Scotch bun is chilli. No peas, just potatoes with all those five different chilies from extremely hot to mild hot. Um, and it's the Indian naga chili we use. And then from the, uh, what, this, what we have today, that is, we don't have the inferno, don't worry about that. <laughs> from the pakora range, with the wheat and gluten free pakora, um, again, extra care needs to be taken. Sorry, pakora? Pakora, in okay. English called bhaji. Oh, right, yes, okay, I'm familiar, it. yes. <laughs> um, in South India, um, uh, the, it's called bhaji, you can have onion bhaji, uh, vegetable bhaji. The, but it's really a pakora in the north, Pakistan and Bangladesh, it's called the pakora. So today we got onion, so that's a natural dominant flavor, naturally sweet. Less sweet is a mixed vegetable, onion, potato, spinach and aubergine. And then we got a spicy, fruity, crunchy one called firecracker. The reason it's called firecracker is when I first started making pakoras a few, a few years ago, that was the spiciest thing I did. And on a cold, icy, minus 10 winter's day, with chilly wind blowing and do the farmers markets and people find the firecracker they say oh it's like a crackly effect inside they're lovely and warm keeping them it's similar to brandy so the name stuck firecracker um, it is a bit deceiving it's extremely hot but it's a lovely aromatic hot because it's got whole spices roasted with pomegranate seeds that's yeah. the very hard to see in there and it's it is a nice one and then uh, you've got to uh, what else have we got uh, those are three vegetarian pakoras and today we've got the paneer pakora which is paneer um, chunks marinated in spices and uh, chilies green chilies as well then dipped in pakora butter and then fried so that's what we have today it sounds fantastic and oh, i bet they've been going down a storm haven't they they have been we've had a lot of people coming and say samosa i can't remember from the last time the samosa and even the traders have been complimenting they've enjoyed the pastry so much um as you can see the pastry doesn't crumble easily but when you warm it up in the oven to get it crispy oh it's a delicious crisp pastry and how can people get hold of these uh, they can get hold of it through our website, Afia Smosa Shop online, and that is at www.a for Apple, F for Freddy, I for India, A for Apple, S for Sugar, dot co dot uk, Afias dot co dot uk. So you go there, go to the um, Rita Gluten Free Samosa page or Rita Gluten Free Pakora page and place an order online. Follow us on Twitter. We're at G Free Radio. So I thought you may like to cheer on some of the many Olympic athletes who follow a gluten-free diet while you're watching the 2014 Winter Olympics. A number of them have been diagnosed with celiac disease. And, you know, you've really got to admire them when they are battling against the elements. They're battling against themselves. They're battling against other people. But also they have their own diets problems potentially to deal with as well and the worries about perhaps uh, the kind of nutrition they're going to get and hopefully they're not going to be glutened in the middle of uh, you know a, a, a fortnight that they've been training for in many cases for virtually their entire lives these are just some of the athletes that we found doing a little bit of research and this one from uh, examiner.com. They include the Chris Creveling, the speed skater who follows a gluten-free diet to reduce inflammation. Uh, Jasmine Fenlater, who's uh, taking part in the bobsled competition. Todd Lodwick, who's a Nordic combined skier. Now, he follows a gluten-free diet to help with inflammation of the lungs. Alana Myers who's uh, in the bobsled team, Sarah Studebaker, 
who's a biathlete. She follows a gluten-free diet, and Sarah's fiancé, Zachary Hall, is a fellow United States biathlon national team member between 07 and 11 and is uh, gluten intolerant. So they say it's much easier if both of them eat gluten-free. They feel better training and uh, feel better while competing as well. Matt Duchesne is in the Canadian uh, ice hockey team. Dasha Geisova, cross-country skiing, was diagnosed with celiac disease in 2008. And diagnosed in 2010, Dominique Malte, who's uh, taking part in the snowboarding competition. Speed skating sees Christine Nesbitt. Look out for her. She's diagnosed uh, in 2012. And Brianne Jenner. Uh, who's taking part again in ice hockey, was diagnosed with CD in 2011. And Dasha Geisova, who I just mentioned there, the uh, cross-country skier and two-time World Cup medalist currently competing in Sochi, is serving as a fitness guru for Glutino Foods out there. And she draws from her personal experience as an athlete to offer the following tips on maintaining a fit, active, gluten-free lifestyle. One... Listen to your body. If you're not feeling well, whether it's a sore muscle or a stomach ache, your body is trying to tell you something, so don't tune it out. Two. Keep a food journal, either on your phone or on paper. Three. Give your friends a personal training session. Teaching them about what you can and can't eat will help them keep them invested in your health and fitness plan. Four. Remember to refuel your body. Carbs are important for an active lifestyle because they provide energy before a workout and can also help with recovery. Five. Drink up. Increasing your fitness level means you need to increase your fluid intake. Six. Don't waste your workouts. Just because you exercised doesn't mean you can eat whatever you want. Be smart about your post-workout snacks. Seven. Don't abandon the plan if your physician has recommended a gluten-free diet. It's with good reason. It's for your health. Eight. Reward yourself for good behaviour. When you're doing well, give yourself a little treat. A little treat. Nine. Remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. If you've got a setback, like getting sick or going off your plan, it doesn't mean your journey's got to end. That setback is in the past. You've got to keep looking forward. As the quote says, a setback is a setup for a comeback. I love that. Finally this week, let's continue our series looking at different alternative grains and flowers and how nice rice is, is what we touched on last week, including a brief look at some of the varieties of long grain rice. Well, next week we'll be doing some short grain rice and looking at some of the different kinds there that you can cook with and the different varieties and different flavours and what they go with, the other foods that you can use those uh, different rices to accompany. So... Long rice last week, short rice next week. So I'll tell you what, let's break the mould. Let's have a little look at five different varieties of medium grain rice this week. It's shorter but plumper than long grain rice, as you might imagine. And when it's cooked, it tends to remain moist and tender. Sticks together more than long grain, but less than short grain. I'm not sure I've realised that before. So short grain is the, is the more sticky. And it's uh, best in things like paella and risotto and casseroles, uh, stuffing, meatloaf, rice salads, um, uh, breads and desserts. Particularly the following five varieties, which are being picked out by livingwithout.com. And Valencia is one of those, classically used in paella. Valencia, or Spanish rice, you may know it better by. It takes its name from a rice-growing province in Spain. It's got a wonderful tendency to absorb the flavours of the food that it's cooked with. But don't overcook it, because it'll become too sticky. And that's a problem with rice, isn't it? As indeed it can be with many gluten-free pastas, of course. Overcook it, just becomes a mushy lump. Black forbidden rice. This sounds so intriguing. I mean... You know, it's all down to the branding and the marketing, and the name is a huge part of that, isn't it? And you may think, oh, well, that's some marketing guru that's come up with some clever phrase in the past few years to sell more of it. But actually, it's Chinese black rice, and the name comes from, well, centuries ago... 
The deep purple colour of cooked forbidden rice, attributed to the high levels of melanin in the bran, can add a serious wow factor to any meal. Isn't that right? When you, I mean, just imagine some black rice on on on, on a plate, particularly if you've got a a, a, a white creamy um, uh, dish with it, or maybe some some really pink prawns or something like that. Would uh, some something with some uh, uh, diced red peppers in or tomatoes? Wouldn't that just look fantastic? Uh, Chinese law says that this rice got its name because only emperors in ancient China were allowed to indulge due to its rarity and nutritional might. Uh, it's got a rich, nutty taste, a chewy texture, and for obvious reasons, cook it separately and then put it with the other ingredients just before serving because otherwise it's going to taint their colour. Look for black rice at some health food stores and Asian markets. Black japonica rice is a blend of 25% Asian black short grain rice and 75% medium grain mahogany rice. Each grain's got plenty of mushroom and nut undertones. You can try serving it with strong flavoured meats like wild game. It's only recently been developed by a family farm in America, the Lundberg family farm, which I think I mentioned last week. A borio, much more of a generic phrase or generic name, is the most popular Italian rice, primarily used to make risotto. Uh, you cook it and the outer part of the grain becomes creamy, the inside slightly firm to the bite. So then you've got that, those different textures there in, in a mouthful, which is really intriguing. Arborio absorbs more liquid and flavours than most other rice types. It's a good stand-in for Valencia when you're making something like a paella. And uh, finally, carnaroli rice. Highly prized Italian plump white rice. It's called the king of rice. And it's ideal for making risotto uh, due to its creamy texture. It can hold its shape really well and it can absorb much more liquid than other rices, including arborio, which is in the same rice family. And you can look for carnaroli rice in Italian markets. OK, that's about it from the G-Free Radio Show this week. Next week, we'll continue our fascinating chat with Shirley Plant. And also, we'll have another look at another G-Free food from another non-Western heritage culture. OK, so uh, next week it's next week it's gluten free curries. So I'll be looking at those next week and also continuing our look at different rices that you can use. So sticky rice and sushi rice coming up in next week's programme and also Bhutanese red rice as well. Until then, look after yourself. Be G free. the G Free Radio Show with Peter Stewart and you. Thanks for listening and remember until next time, be good, be healthy and be G Free.